This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I started Self Work almost seven years ago. In fact, next week we're going to have a big anniversary celebration. We started it seven years ago in order to extend the walls of my practice to those of you who might already be very interested in this kind of thing. Maybe you're in therapy to those of you who are looking for some answers because you've got struggles you're stuck in. But there's also a third group of you. To those of you who might be very skeptical about mental health treatment, about therapy in general, but you're curious enough or, sadly, unhappy enough to give self-work a listen. So welcome. This October is actually it's designated for many different months as far as awareness, but it's ADHD Awareness Month. ADHD traditionally stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, but there's one called Inattentive ADHD. It used to be called ADD, just Attention Deficit Disorder. That's what we're talking about today, and boy, if you have it, or you know someone, you love someone that has it, this is the episode to listen to because we have a woman who's lived with it all of her life and she tells these incredible stories in her book about some of the problems and the struggles it's caused her, but also some of the blessings of it. Her name, Cynthia Hammer, and the name of her book is Living with Inattentive ADHD. She wasn't actually diagnosed with it until she was 49 years of age, and she was crushed by the news. But basically, she began to slowly accept its challenges and then learn ways to reduce negative effects through new behaviors and habits. But the way she tells her stories, and friends, this is a woman who's almost 80 years old, and she's lived an extremely physical, athletic life, and it was a joy talking with her. It's really profoundly empowering. I got goosebumps several times just hearing her stories, which I hope you will too. She has a master's in social work as well. In 1994, she founded the nonprofit ADD Resources, and then in 2021, she founded the nonprofit Inattentive ADHD Coalition because of her concern that too many children and adults with inattentive ADHD remain undiagnosed or incorrectly diagnosed. And I will tell you, I am sure I'm one of the people that has done that, and I learned a lot from her. So tune in. We're going to be sponsored today by Magnesium Breakthrough made by Buy Optimizers. I just heard another expert on Jay Shetty's podcast talking about the importance of magnesium as far as they're great for releasing muscular tension and also really as a side effect really great bowel movements so there you go if you struggle with constipation magnesium breakthrough might just be for you so listen in we'll hear from mag breakthrough and their current offer and then we'll hear from cynthia hammer I hope you truly enjoyed some time with family and friends this summer and got to take a break from the daily grind and enjoy your life. Perhaps you've indulged a bit on ice cream to beat the heat or a margarita or two. Gosh, lots of indulgence may become the norm, but now kids are back in school and it's time to get back on track. If you struggle to return to your health routine, there are three major things to prioritize. Healthy eating, exercise, and above all, quality sleep. Because sleep is the key to your body's rejuvenation and repair process. It actually controls hunger and weight loss hormones, boosts energy levels, and it impacts countless other functions. That's why I take magnesium daily, but not any supplement. I got Magnesium Breakthrough because it's just better. It's made by by optimizers, and I highly recommend it. It has seven forms of magnesium designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. And guess what? If you get more sleep, you're going to find out that your healthy eating and exercise may be a little easier to do. So visit magbreakthrough.com slash selfwork. Don't forget to enter code selfwork10 for 10% off any order. Once again, it's magbreakthrough.com slash selfwork. (music) 
So I'm so pleased to introduce to you Cynthia Hammer as we get right into our discussion of her book. So what made you want to write a book, Cynthia? I didn't start out with the aspiration to write a book. I actually, when COVID started, I was just planning to take some time to write a memoir for my yeah. sons. I have three children oh. and I had never really told them very much about my life. And who knows at what age they might decide they want to know or if my grandchildren would want to know. So sure. I started out with that in mind. But then as I wrote, I thought it, I learned uh, there were a lot of free classes on how to write better. So mm -hmm. I was taking those during COVID. We were isolated. We were staying home. So then I just uh, decided I would try to make it into a book that I would sell. And I hired a developmental editor that helped me. Sure. And that's, that's well, how it happened. It, it's, it's really, it's, I, it's, it's chock full of, personal kind of memories and experiences that you had that pointed to you having inattentive ADHD, although you weren't diagnosed until you were 49. Is that right? right. Shortly after I got diagnosed, I started a nonprofit back then called ADD Resources. We put together a little booklet. We put together weekly news, monthly newsletters, and I wrote yeah. for those. Okay. So by saving those, and at that time, my writing was more like journaling. It was more um, healing myself. So sure. those stories I then incorporated into the memoir. Okay. So did you, have you seen therapists for, or some clinicians or doctors trying to understand, I mean, did you realize something was off or that you were different or that I love the term neurodiverse at this point, that's what a lot of people call it? Well, actually, neurodiverse, they're saying everyone is neurodiverse. Oh, okay. But there's some of us that are neurodivergent. Ah, neurodivergent. Okay, yeah. got it. Oh, got and it. And so, I'm trying to remember your question. Oh, okay. So, for myself, I think almost everyone that has undiagnosed ADD knows their lifelong that they're different. Mm -hmm. And some of them feel so different that they go to see therapists. They go trying to figure out what's the matter. Sure. That wasn't my case. I felt I was different. Um, I had a friend that told me her social work training, which is what I had too, was very helpful in understanding herself. Mm -hmm. So even after I got my diagnosis and I did take medication, it was from my own learning and my own reading that I helped myself improve. Back then, there weren't coaches. I never considered mm -hmm. therapy. Mm -hmm. So I, the improvement I had, I did myself and what I, how I help myself is part of what I share in the book. So just so our listeners know, you, you are, we are both older. Yes. <laughs> older. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, my birthday is on October 17th and I'm huh. turning 80 years old. Oh, well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you. I'll, I'm turning 69 in about three weeks. So oh, wonderful you for you. So, yeah, and you've been quite physically active. You really, uh, you've done some incredible things. Um, well, uh, physical activity, even for depression, physical activity is great. It's a very sure. helpful. Besides making you have a strong body, it helps you to have a stronger mind, I think. Sure. You know, one of the things that... I was so struck by, it. and I actually another reason. I mean, I've been a therapist for thirty years, but ah. and I I've been able. I'm. I mean, it's you, you have to sort of have your brain turned off not to be able to pick up on ADHD. But those with inattentive ADHD are now. It used to be called ADD. Now it's called inattentive ADHD. Um, I'm sure I missed. I'm sure I missed a bunch of people. As you yeah. as you say in your book, I probably diagnosed them with some mild depression or anxiety or just some. I mean, you you mentioned through the book so many characterological traits, mm -hmm. uh, stubbornness, um, 
defensiveness uh gosh uh, of course the impulsivity that is that is so easily attributed to other things in mental health so i was very very struck by that and and humbled by it <laughs> yeah well when i went to social work school we were taught if someone was late for an appointment you would look on that as resistant to treatment yes <laughs> you know and for someone with add uh being on time is really a problem and i know one woman coach she thinks it's unfair for a coach to penalize a client who shows up late because if you go in the business of helping people with add before they've really learned how to manage their characteristics, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's unrealistic to expect them that they're going to show up on time or that they're going to um, remember every single appointment. I was diagnosed when it was called ADD, and so often I'm just calling it that because before it used to be that way. If you didn't have all the physical hyperactivity, it, it was called ADD. Attention now, Deficit Disorder is what that stands for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now they just say, oh, we all have very busy brains. And that's what ties us all together. But as you're saying, it's hard to notice a busy brain. You right. Know <laughs> right. Yeah. I loved your Buddha story in your book. Can ah. you can you give it a context? And because people, let me see, I have it down here. Um that there were some things well you talk if you want to share about allison sure. um but there was a real tie-in between what happened with your daughter and yeah. this buddha story right um well when i got diagnosed i told people i never will be happy to know about my adhd even though it was 20 years after my daughter had died mm -hmm. i felt i now understood why she had died which was we had been in the Peace Corps and we came back to the U.S. and still had four pills to take for anti-malarial. Mm -hmm. And I, in unpacking the suitcase, I didn't know where to put these pills. I didn't put them right away in a safe place. Mm -hmm. And my daughter ended up swallowing these pills and dying two days later. Just so I can't even not understanding how this happened. My husband being a doctor, he also felt very guilty that he hadn't helped with the medicine. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as a couple, we were really struggling. And somehow I got sure. a hold of Buddha's philosophy where he talked. He was counseling a woman who was very sad and he told her to go on a journey and knock on every single door and see if she could find a home where there was no sadness. And she went for years, I guess, and never found someone. So I think that awareness that everyone, it's very difficult to get through life with a perfect life. Even now, my sister that I would think had a perfect life, her husband has Parkinson's disease and it's been going on for two or three years. He's slowly disappearing. Um, the children say, I no longer recognize my father. So right. I just think you have to realize none of us get through life without some sadness. And that, I don't know, that that is um, a solace. Sure it's, it is. It makes you it feel is. better that, that you're not so different your life right. is not so much uh, worse than someone else's it, i don't know it just it does make you feel better yes and i think it also tends to whatever you know i must have done wrong something wrong that this happened to me i must be a bad person because this happened to me that it also equalizes that you know not everybody is uh, terrible. Your sister's not terrible or your brother-in-law is not terrible because he, he's not being punished somehow. Uh, these accidents happen and mistakes happen. And, um, and so they are tragic and they're to be grieved, uh, for, for a long time. But I mean, again, I, the, the book is just full of stories about how you found yourself in either dangerous or, uh, 
embarrassing or just, uh, you know, kind of had to shake your head and go, well, that's just me stories, you know. Well, I think a lot of that actually is shame based. And when adults finally get diagnosed, there's a lot of shame and negative self-talk that they have to work to overcome. Mm -hmm. I noted that you said the diagnosis can be something of ADD, can be something that is relieving because you realize there, you know, I fit this, this is why I've had the problems I've had, that I'm neurodivergent and that that I haven't known that and Mm -hmm. I haven't been treated for that. So I've made these mistakes or or been difficult to get along with because I I can't focus or I seem to not be tuned in or whatever Mm -hmm. the issue is. Um, but you told this incredibly dramatic story about, and I didn't know what sailboarding was. I actually looked it up. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, you're <laughs> inland in Arkansas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So uh, can you tell the story about, because it points out the very strange, maybe anomaly or the strange part of having ADD that you can also hyper focus. And you you talked about how that almost saved your life because you were hyper-focusing on something. Can you tell that story? Well, I wouldn't say it led to saving my life. The guy who saw you out in the ocean yes. is the person who yeah, saved your right. life. Yeah, right. But um, you were a lot, you were, it kept you emotionally, you know, kind oh, of yes, safe. Yes, not stable. falling apart. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so we've learned recently that people with ADD, uh, From research, they're saying we die on average 12 years earlier than the average population. And it's the attributes of our ADD when they're not treated that contribute to our early deaths. And one of those is, um, well, look, car accidents, trips to the emergency room, whatever. But some of it is impulsivity or risk taking. And those came together for me Mm -hmm. because I, 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 wanted to sailboard and there's a level of sailboarding where you learn to um, just hold the sail and pop up onto the board. I wasn't at that level yet. So I went down to the water near my house, which I never saw a sailboarder down there. And I was to learn why, because as I got in the water, the, the waves it started to be an outgoing tide and the the wind picked up, so my sails were too big for me to easily pull up out of the water. So I was getting exhausted trying to pull the sail up. The waves were pulling me away from the shore, and I had to make a quick decision. Do I either abandon my board and swim to shore or... If you could. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't sure. By the time I needed to make a decision, I wasn't in the right place to make a decision. It was also very so, cold. Yes, that's true, too. And I just had on a life jacket, not a wetsuit. And I just stayed on the board and I went out to sea. And my husband was watching for me in the car, but he was reading a book. And when he looked up, he didn't see me. All he could assume was I had sailed somehow to one of the restaurants along the waterfront. But to be safe, he went and got a friend and they borrowed a boat. They went out in the water and they, I was out on the sailboard and I heard them, but I mean, I heard a motor, but then the motor turned around and they said the reason they turned around is because they didn't believe I could have gone that far. Right. So it was only this man on shore who some people, when they have a house that looks out on the water, they have a telescope. Telescope. Mm -hmm. He was looking out at the water and saw my sailboat and he alerted the fireboat and they went out to look for me. And the waves were so high that the man in his house up on the hill in his telescope had to guide them to where I was. I've got chill bumps. I mean, I've got chill uh, bumps. And just, um, it was just as the sun was going down. So the point that um, you were trying to have me make is (laughs) I didn't know about hyper-focusing, but I said to myself, I realized that I was going to die that night. I knew that I would fall off the board and just become hypothermic in the cold water. And so I told myself, this is the last sunset I will see. 
and so enjoy it. And I sat on my board going very, very fast like I was on a white white water rafting. My board was going that fast and the waves were that high. And I just said, enjoy your last sunset. And so I felt very calm. And when I look back on my symptoms of ADHD, I realized I I was able to Mm hyper-focus on the sunset. Mm -hmm. And it was a very peaceful feeling. I just um, was uh, so moved by that story. And because I have had... I actually, it's, I knew about the hyper focusing aspect of ADD, inattentive ADD, or even ADHD. Yeah. And the people I have, uh, I won't say successfully, I will just say, um, I stumbled <laughs> on the fact that that's what was wrong was that uh-huh. they were able to say to me, I don't know why I can all of a sudden zone in on something and, Ah. And I can get it done and I lose sight of everything else, but I can't remember whether or not I ate breakfast or, or I can't remember when I'm supposed to pick up my children at work, you know, at school or, you know, whatever. It's, it, it's a conundrum. And you were just very honest and, um, about some of the social difficulties that then, people with inattentive ADHD have the you named defensiveness they need a lot of they want control they don't pick up on social nuance Mm -hmm. Uh, you know they don't say things the way that other people can hear them they sort of want to rush relationships I had never heard of many of those ah ah well if you even go to Reddit, you find that people with ADD, we find most conversations um, boring. <laughs> and and only if we're able to go deep on something and, you know, really exercise our brain and uh, have a popcorn kind of talk back and forth where we're willing to interrupt each other because we thought of something else we wanted to say and we're fine with that. So the conversation is very lively. Uh, we find saying, how are you today? I'm fine. All those uh, gracious remarks that people learn to say, those are challenging for us because mm-hmm. they, we consider them kind of boring. Right. Um, and so we do have social issues. I mean, this is a, a thing that's getting more talked about is rejection, sensitivity, dysphoria. And a lot of women Say experience that. Over again. that. Re- rejection. Gen- sensitivity, dysphoria. Ah. RSD. And so if they see someone look the wrong way at them, they might ruminate and worry about it for days. If someone says something to them, maybe in a kind way, but they interpret it as a judgment, they will be, you know, ruminating it and worrying it. And and it's a struggle, struggle for them to get beyond that. Um, the other thing that happens with uh, more with women is they mask because they feel like they don't fit in, so they pretend behaviors because they want to fit in. And in the process of masking, they lose who they really are. And so sometimes they need the therapy to help them go back to realize who they are. And I I don't think I wrote about this in the book, but I told Mm -hmm. people I I don't recall masking. I, I my thing more was I I felt like I missed the manual that all these other women got the manual on how to behave, how to interact, right. what, how to talk. And I missed the manual. And, but I didn't pretend that I knew the manual. Do you know what I mean? I just missed the manual. Well, I'm thinking about the inattentive to inattention to cues, social cues. That's true of being on the spectrum or having some mild autism. How, how, yes. how would you compare and contrast that? Well, Actually, what they're finding out now, are, and I can't say, the per- there's a percentage of overlap. And okay. so I think it's more common in the people that have the inattentive type that mm-hmm. we would have some of the autistic types. And for myself, now that I've learned more about autism, I think 
there's certain parts of my life routine does not bother me the least. Like I can eat the same cereal every morning. I enjoy doing the same exercise routine every day. And yet there's other parts of my life that I could not tolerate doing the same old, same old, same old thing. If we go, go anywhere on a trip, it's always to a new place. You mm-hmm. know, if I, w- I ran this other nonprofit, we put on conferences, newsletters. I got to the point that I, I couldn't, you know, almost like physically stomach doing another one. It just got so mundane, so sure. repetitive. So sure. I had that balance of I like some things to be routine because it makes my life simple. I don't have decisions to make. And yet other parts of my life, I thrive on variety. And the other issue for me that um, I relate to as a autistic spectrum kind of characteristic is I have a real need to be very honest, Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, almost a rigidity about honesty and about justice. So I like to talk to the people who listen to self-work about what you can do about it. And you have a whole, you had a couple of chapters, if not, uh, you just kind of sprinkle throughout the book about how you can begin to help yourself. Um. Uh, deal with some of the negative implications of inattentive ADHD. So Mm -hmm. things like, I mean, finding a home for things and making yourself put something in its home, you know, that kind of thing. Can you talk about some of those things? Sure. Well, for me, people with ADD, if you you read about them, they'll have like 100 tabs open on their computer. (laughs) We're always into multitasking because we think it's more exciting, it's more interesting. But for me, my best advice, if you wanted to heal from your ADHD, is you just have to focus on improving one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And what I advise is you think of the simplest thing you could change that's the, e- the simplest thing to change that's going to make the most difference. And for me, that was putting my credit card back where it belonged in my wallet. And for a neurotypical person, they would probably be laughing at that. And that's why I'm saying we're ashamed of some of the, the things mm-hmm. we fail at. But if I was shopping and I had put my credit card back in my coat pocket, or I had laid it down and forgot where it was, it, it, I would be at the checkout stand not able to buy the groceries that I had. Right. So sometimes the simplest behavior, changing that, is your step number one to making you feel like you have your life in control. What about some of these more social aspects like the defensiveness or the... Um, picking up on social cues or rushing relationships. Do you have any ideas about what you can do about that? What's the most rewarding is for me, I joined activities where there was some structure, but it wasn't like I had to show up on a certain time. It was up to me whether I wanted to show up that day. And so going on a bicycle ride with friends where we could talk while we were riding. We could, you know, I, it wasn't a forced thing. It was a relaxed situation. Mm -hmm. The same with going, um, I joined Toastmasters, you know, to, to, so you form relationships where there's some structure. So it gives you a little bit more guidance. Can you tell listeners what Toastmasters is? Oh, (laughs) sure. It's, um, an organization and there's usually, um, a branch of it, maybe in your community or a nearby mm-hmm. community, it's a great place for you to go to learn practice speaking, public speaking, mm-hmm. and for learning the skills of t- thinking on your feet, of not putting a lot of likes and ahs and ums in your conversation, the, the practicing writing speeches. It, it it was it's very. If you're planning to have any kind of public role, I would say Toastmasters is a good place to start. It's a great place to start. I kept asking myself, okay, as a clinician, if I wasn't recognizing this particular dynamic or if I, this diagnosis didn't occur to me, what would be the word that I would probably come up with that I would think, gosh, 
Huh. And this is this is what I decided. Their life is just so chaotic. Ah. There's a certain kind of chaos that's that these people create, not <laughs> with malintent or with any yeah. kind of actual intent at all it's just it just exists and is inherent in their uh struggles to organize and to focus right and the other we're trying to collect um descriptions from adults who got diagnosed in late in life with the inattentive type how could someone have a, recognized you as a child? And so some of those behaviors we're gathering because teachers and other people just think it's the physical hyperactivity and they're missing the people that don't have that. Right. And so right. the same for adults. Some of the things that would stand out is you listen to their lives. They have variable performance. They don't even know themselves why sometimes they did, they were able to pay attention and really absorb something. Mm -hmm. And other times they would be like a flake. So right, that variable right. attention, the chaos in their lives. Um, sometimes you'll hear a spouse saying, I didn't think I was going to have a third child, which was the husband uh, or the husband becomes a caretaker for the wife because there's just so many issues. But the marriages that do end up happy is where the wife is bringing some liveliness and activity and new new ideas into the relationship, sure. and maybe the the other spouse is bringing the stabi stability. Yes, that makes sense. You know, um, one of the things that you point out in the book is that why often this um, particular issue gets stigmatized is because the medication is. One that if I took it, it would be a stimulant for me. Mm -hmm. And so it is like, okay, so you're just, you're just drug seeking, you know. Well, and the other thing is that I think now they've developed um, long acting medication. So yes. I mm -hmm. think it becomes less of an issue that they're drug seeking because a long active medication would not give you that uh, hit like mm -hmm. a short acting medication okay. would. So anything else you want to make sure you say um, as our time begins to wane a bit here? Well, I'd love to say the title of my book. Oh, sure, of course. And let <laughs> me show it. It's Living with Inattentive ADHD, Climbing the Circular Staircase of Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. So the other thing I'd like to say is I did start a new nonprofit, this time for inattentive ADHD, and the website for that is www.iadhd.org, and we're also on LinkedIn and Facebook if you wanted to keep up with what we're doing. Great. Can you repeat that? Website is www.i for inattentive ADHD.org. Great. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I so appreciate you being with me this morning and happy birthday in a couple of weeks or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, you, I love your um, slow, moderate style of speaking. I wish I had uh, uh, followed that a little bit more. <laughs> well, it comes from growing up in the South, I think. Uh, uh. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Take care Thank of you yourself, for having Cynthia. me. Of course. Thank you. Bye, bye bye for now. Thanks so much for listening today. I'm so glad to be back from vacation. And as I say, we're going to have a special episode of Self Work next week to celebrate our seventh anniversary. And it'll be the first episode in our eighth year. We did have a winner of Marriage is Not for Chickens. I'll talk more about that next time. But if you're the one who left the review in September, I only got one. <laughs> Maybe those of you who didn't do it will get a little bit more motivated. A lot of you left ratings, but that's not what I'm talking about when I talk about reviews. Anyway, maybe we'll talk about that next time. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Please take care of yourself, your family, and your community. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.